Good morning, folks. I'd like to read from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. And so those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against one another, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. I'd like to share this thought before we have some special music. Uh, Father, let me see the world the way you do. Give me compassion for those around me. Help me to be an instrument of your grace. Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus. I want to thank Jerry and Mim for the special music. It was quite appropriate uh, special music for this time. I'd also like to read a passage of scripture that's also appropriate, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. 
For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his life span? And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not so much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Do not be anxious, then, I say, for what you shall eat or what you shall drink. With what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things, but seek first the kingdom of his righteousness, kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Let each day, each day has enough trouble of its own. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me and you and our loved ones and our friends and everyone else, whether they realize it or not. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, may we take this uh, scripture to heart and what you've laid upon my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, folks, this is Corona Sunday number two, the second Sunday that we are in self-quarantine as a church family. Actually, self-quarantine is probably not technically accurate, and this is how... It was explained to me by somebody who was close to the medical profession. Self-quarantine is if one has been exposed to someone who has tested positive, then we self-quarantine. Quarantine is if one has been tested positive, then they are to quarantine themselves. Reverse quarantine is where one quarantines to keep oneself from coming in contact with someone who actually may be infected. So it's a matter of semantics, yet the end result is the same. It's quarantine. But I guess technically we're in reverse quarantine from one another. So questions remain. uh, What are we going to do for the next couple of weeks? Uh, We will continue to follow the federal and state guidelines as recommended, and therefore we will not be meeting through Easter Sunday. Uh, For how long will this continue? We really don't know, we're not sure. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? We hope so, there's some talk and speculation of that. And so in the meantime, uh, we are going to seek to do the right thing and, and follow the guidelines that are being recommended. But needless to say, this situation has created a lot of anxiety and concern, uh, financial instability, social chaos actually in some sectors of our society, and uncertainty all across the country and the world. And with that said, this perfectly fits into the worldly thought process of looking to government and looking to the politicians to see what they can do um, and how they're going to solve this problem, rather than looking to what God can do and what he might be doing. Uh, The other day I read an article about sensing the spiritual times in which we live. Recall Jesus said to the Pharisees that they could discern the weather, but they could not sense the spiritual climate of their day. In other words, they did not recognize the Lord Jesus Christ and what God was doing in Christ at that time. We see this in our day. People discern the weather. We have this favorite expression, Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. And yet, many people are not sensing the spiritual climate of our times. The article that I read raised some great questions. For example, what is God saying to our hearts during this crisis? How is he speaking to the church? What might he be saying to the world? And so, 
as we reflect on those questions, I think that this is a spiritual recalibration of sorts. And so as we take a look at Matthew chapter 6 before us, Jesus spoke about God's provision and how we are to assess his provision, how we are not to be anxious about tomorrow, and how we are to seek God's kingdom. And I remind you, when we seek God's kingdom, let's be mindful that we are seeking the king. Now, let me suggest to you that there are two responses that we can embrace today or any day or at any time in history uh, with crisis or circumstance. The first response is that we can embrace a mindset that provision comes from government. And when we do, we embrace the kingdom of this world. Again, just take a look at the news media, and it's all about government provision. What the government is doing, what the government isn't doing, what the government should be doing, what the government is talking about doing, and what actions they are taking, what actions they are not taking. I, it's, an, it's enough to put your head on a swivel and spin it for 24 hours or more. Now, admittedly, we're all dependent on government to some extent. We're dependent on government to enforce the rule of law. We are dependent on government to enact laws and regulations for the good of society, not to the detriment of society. And we're dependent on government to provide stability and structure in our society. But here's, here's the caveat. We can easily fall into the spiritual trap and adopt a thought process of looking to government for all our answers. And we fall into this mindset of being dependent upon government for everything. And uh, folks, I have to tell you, I'm personally very leery of becoming dependent on government for anything or being dependent upon any person or any thing for that matter, except being dependent upon God. But un unfortunately, our societies more and more become dependent upon government. This is not biblical and this is not good. For example, many of our senior citizens are dependent on social security checks. This should not be the case. Just imagine if all the money that those senior citizens had paid to the government for all the years that they had worked had been put in a personal savings account, they would have had 40% more in, in retirement. And it would have amassed to um, over millions of dollars. And our senior citizens wouldn't be dependent on a social security check by the government because it would be their own money in their own bank account. Now, we recognize that government is ordained of God, and yet in many cases, government creates a false dependency. But isn't this what the authoritative structures and politicians eventually do? They create government dependency to justify their positions and the need for more government. They take from the people and then they give back to the people in times of crisis. They even prioritize the printing of money because they've spent it all and they do not balance budgets. Then they pat themselves on the back on issuing checks to us, which was our money to begin with. And in the process, they run up the national debt which someone at some point in time will have to pay for. It's either us, our children, our grandchildren, or our great-grandchildren. And then they expect us to vote for them because they gave us something. Uh, folks, that's a classic quid pro quo. That's creating dependency. Now, I am not saying that we do not need government. Uh, Romans chapter 13 indicates that government is ordained of God and it's supposed to be an agent or to administer the good for society in a godly way. But what I am saying is that our provision does not come from government. Government does not have all the answers. And this is why it is a false dependency. Uh, I say people are looking for a savior in all the wrong places. They're looking for government to save them rather than looking to God who has all the answers. And in fact, I would say to you, it's high time that we address this dependency because it actually is an addiction in our society. What is the government going to do for me? 
Listen, God uses government for our provision, but it's not the end all or the be all. It does not mean that everything government does is godly and in accordance with biblical principles. And I think we can easily see that if we read our Bibles and uh, know the Lord Jesus. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm going after a mindset that I see these days. And so I ask you, uh, is government the solution to all of our problems? Or does God have the answer to all of our problems? Of course, the answer we know is God, not government. Many times, government creates problems. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, I want you to notice that Jesus never mentioned provision coming from government. This is because God is the source of all provision. He didn't even mention employers. Why? Because ultimately, God is the source of all provision. I had a dear friend years ago, he's with the Lord, he was very sickly in bed, had just gotten out of the hospital, and so I visited with him one day, and during that visit, his wife comes in with the mail, she hands it to him, he goes through it, and he pulls out this letter from his employer. He opens it up, and he reads the letter in my presence, and it talked about he was no longer going to be employed. And so I'll never forget what my friend said, as he read, after reading the letter aloud, he said, and my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, and not according to, and then he named his employer. Uh, folks, we need to be reminded that it is God who supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory, uh, not government, not employers. By God's good graces, he uses these means to provide for us. God uses a variety of means and circumstances, but all our provision doesn't come through our employers or through the government. Now, I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Let me read that for you. Not that I speak from one, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both having abundance and suffering need. Uh, brothers and sisters, it's high, high time that we learn or relearn this truth. Uh, now, we've been very, very blessed in our country. We have a very, very prosperous society, but many have not learned the humble and the suffering part of what the Apostle Paul wrote about, of having much and then not having much. So, again, provision comes through a variety of means, but it's the God who is the source of all that provision. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4 was blessing and thanking the church for the way in which God sent him that gift and God worked in and through them. So here is the spiritual takeaway. Provision is God-given. Everything is a means to an end, but it comes from Almighty God. And this is the biblical principle that we are not to lose sight of. And yet I'm uh, concerned that in our society, we've totally lost sight of this. I, I also want you to notice in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus encouraged his disciples to look at the birds of the air. He encouraged his disciples to consider the flowers, the lilies of the field. God takes care of it all. T take a look at verse 26. Are you not worth much more than they, the flowers and the sparrow, the birds? Uh, this is a fitting word for many people being laid off during this time because people are wondering how things are going to shake out. Uh, there's great anxiety and concern about where things are headed, where their provision will come from. Uh, listen, we will sicken ourselves if we let this dominate our mind and our thinking. This is why Jesus mentioned about not being anxious five times in this passage. You can count it. Five times in the passage, Jesus mentioned about not being anxious. And uh, folks, it's easy to do. 
And it's easy to leave God out in this process. Anxiety, trust me, anxiety will multiply exponentially if we leave God out of our thought process. Uh, I want you to think about this. We have so much comfort in America compared to third world countries. We have far more than most people. We're better off than probably 95% of the world. And yet, we too can fall into the category of, oh, men of little faith, when we get laid off or when we see our provision shrink. By the way, did I mention the disciples had already left their full-time jobs to follow Jesus. Now, they didn't get laid off. They willfully left their jobs to follow Jesus. But provision had to be a, a concern for them. They did have families. They were commissioned by God before they were sent out. And they were told that they would be dependent on a variety of means and through a variety of circumstances. Their dependency, though, wasn't on government. Their dependency was on God and how he would provide. And sometimes it would be great and in abundance, and sometimes it would be not as great and in abundance. But God was going to take care of them. God was going to provide. And that needs to be our focus during these times. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides, is the spiritual antidote for our time. And we need to take our eyes and our minds off these moments and this situation as we get through this. We need to be reminded and reflectful of the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. Uh, somebody uh, the other month gave us a bird feeder uh, because uh, they had the bird feeder set up on their lawn and their cat was stalking the birds. So they, they sent it our way and they placed it outside our kitchen window as we stand over the sink, you can easily look out and see the bird feeder. I'm telling you folks, uh, the birds coming and going is busier than O'Hare International Airport, especially right now. And But they're just absolutely amazing creatures to watch, birds of all kind. And, and they seem to be nervous, yet I will tell you, as I've pondered and looked at them, they do not seem to worry or have a care in the world about where their next meal is going to come from. Now, is God using us right now to feed them? Yes. But God was feeding them before we put up the bird feeder. Are they worrying about the bird feeder not being there tomorrow? I don't think so. Maybe they don't think in that capacity, but I don't think so. And, and as for taking note of the flowers, the lilies, the daisies, the dandelions, the tulips, whatever your favorite flower is, take a look at the flower, the flowers of the field. The Lord Jesus mentioned that Solomon, King Solomon was not even clothed like these. Now, King Solomon was perhaps the wealthiest man who ever lived. Jeff Bezos has nothing on King Solomon when it comes to riches, and yet the Lord reminds us that King Solomon was not as well-dressed as the lilies of the field. What an amazing statement of provision. So the Lord will provide, as it says in Genesis 22, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. And I remind you that Abraham realized that as he was on his way to sacrifice Isaac, Isaac asked about the sacrifice. He said, well, God, we have the, or Father, we have the fire and the wood, but where is the sacrifice? And what did Abraham say? God will provide the sacrifice. So Abraham understood completely Jehovah Jireh. And, and this leads me to make another life learned observation here. There is something to be said for taking the time to enjoy and observe nature. I grew up on the streets of Philadelphia. I tell, tell people I grew up on concrete and asphalt. Actually, when I was very, very young, we couldn't even roller skate, roller skate on our street because we had cobblestones. Much of what you would see maybe in New Bedford, Massachusetts and other uh, antiquated portions of, of, of cities. Uh, but cobblestones are real neat. 
And, and so uh, only when they paved them could we roller skate. And then years later, I found myself working in downtown Philadelphia for over three and a half years. And I lived the hustle and bustle of city life. And folks, I am telling you, it's frantic and fast paced. And you know something? For all the pigeons and all the birds that I saw going in and out of downtown and going on the subway, I never, ever, ever once stopped to actually consider them and to see the way that God takes care of them. And I'm going to say that it's often very hard to find God in the hustle and bustle of life, especially city life. And if you read the Gospels, the Lord Jesus Christ retreated from such an environment. He did so to spend time in prayer and reflection. And there's something to be said for getting away from it all, to find solace and solitude, and to kind of hit the pause button of life. And I believe that nature provides a better setting to find God more readily. Now, I'm not sure if there's a correlation here, but scripture tells us that it was Cain who built the first city. That's pretty interesting. Uh, now, I'm quite sure that I would not have wanted to live in the city of Enoch, the city that Cain founded after his firstborn. And for obviously obvious reasons, uh, Cain was a godless man. He killed his brother. And I find that there is less trouble, less crime, generally less problems when you live outside the city. And so in coming from the city, uh, I find that I like it better outside the city. One final thought. In mentioning trouble, if you take a look at the text, Jesus said that each day has enough trouble of its own. Folks, tomorrow will always take care of itself because God goes before all of our tomorrows. He's got it all figured out. So for now, I would say to you, if we have food, clothing, and shelter for each day, we need to find contentment in that. Uh, even in that, Jehovah Jireh, in the mount of the Lord, it is provided. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, may we see the source, you as the source of all divine provision and blessing, and that you use uh, the government and employers and other people and circumstances uh, according to your honor and to your glory to increase our faith. And we, we pray uh, for those that are laid off during this time, that they would find great strength and great uh, comfort and great hope uh, in your words. Uh, we bless you and thank you for going before all of our tomorrows. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.